I'm the President International from the New York Times, and a very warm welcome to you all, both here in the, in the forum and also all of you uh, joining us from around the world uh, virtually. Um, I'm now we need to find new ways to uh, fuel our future and to energize our future society. This wonderful idea to convert wind into a fuel, which can be used in all the um, infrastructure which we already have. A concept like this has never been done before. We need to look at the most eligible places in the world where we can produce hydrogen or derivatives of hydrogen. The available wind power in Haruoni or in Magellan is just amazing. The high wind speed, the constant wind speed, and it's always coming from one direction. Haruoni is like exploring the future already today. For decarbonization, for society, but also for my children. Brad Plummer, I would like to invite you to come up on stage. Brad, give him a warm welcome, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you. Uh, thanks for having us here. And uh, we're going to start a panel in a moment. I'm going to uh, invite Rachel Kite and AJ Matter to come on up, our two panelists in person. And then we're going to have two virtual panelists. All right, we can take a seat. Um, and I believe we will have our virtual panelists joining. We have uh, Jessica Matthews, the CEO of Uncharted. Um, and we have Ignacio Galan, the uh, CEO of uh, Iberdrola, a uh, major renewable company. And then Rachel Kite is the uh, dean of the Fletcher School of Law and Diplomacy at Tufts University. And uh, Dr. A.J. Matter is the Director General of the International Solar Alliance. Um, so in this panel today, it's called The Great Reversal. Basically, we're going to talk a little bit about uh, some of the uh, progress that the world has been making on climate change. And we've seen some pretty impressive uh, gains over the last decade. Uh, we've seen the rise in renewable energy, you know, electric vehicles, which were once seen as a niche technology, now set record sales each year. We see uh, various countries, uh, both uh, here at COP um, and at home, and, and states and cities setting uh, new climate targets. But we also know, uh, and lots has been written about, how it's not nearly enough. So a big question is, uh, you know, what additional levers uh, can work to accelerate uh, decarbonization, to accelerate progress on climate change. And, um, you know, we know that there are a lot of things that have been uh, used so far. There are government policies, but then there are also uh, companies in voluntary action. We know uh, finance is a big piece of this, and how to get finance flowing to cleaner energy is a big question. We've seen cities and states, um, you know, communities acting on their own. And then we've also seen uh, civil society groups, and environmental groups, uh, activist groups, really putting the pressure on both governments and companies. Um, and, you know, that's been one uh, big lever for change. Uh, so I want to kick off this discussion um, and uh, um, Ignacio, I think I'll go to you first. We've um, you know, over the last decade, we've really seen renewable energy become this, uh, this major force in the world. It's gone from this niche technology to really mainstream, where, you know, it's, it's uh, one of the cheapest, if not the cheapest, new source of electricity in many markets. And I was wondering if you could tell us a bit about what some of the levers that have been pulled to get us there. How do we get from, you know, renewable energy being this small, uh, technology to something that's that's mainstream and really growing fast today, and what can we learn from that that progress? Uh, I think you're muted. Sorry. So, uh, at the energy landscape has already uh, very different what it was 20 years ago. So. Uh, I think when we started already just trying to make the things in a different manner. 
So uh, uh, for uh, most people, there was not an alternative to fossil fuels. Uh, electrification it was not at that time a public debate. Uh, power systems were based in large thermal stations, far away from consumption centers. Networks has been designed to support, of course, this model in which energy flow is what, just in one direction. Uh, and they were not uh, flexible or digitalized. It still is not in many countries. So uh, uh, 20 years ago, clean energy was not considered as an option. Uh, I think it's, uh, uh, I was suffering uh, words like, we never blow it when it's needed, said by some of my colleagues and competitors. But uh, Kyoto had already happened. Uh, and I think when I joined the company 20, 21 years ago, we knew that uh, we want to decarbonize, uh, we try to make that one. I, I think we need uh, to change the way how we produce and consume ed 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 energy. Uh, the technology, uh, I think, uh, it already exists. Uh, and we need this because uh, we've been in Iberdrola, it's a company 120 years old, with our origins, we are already generating hydro for this almost 120 years. Uh, we uh, had already started to produce as well with other technology at that time, like uh, the most competitive one, like on short wind. Uh, and, uh, and we have already uh, decided to invest massively in renewable, network energy storage. The fact we transform all our, our hydroelectric power plant in reversible to be able to work as a pump uh, and to use as well as uh, generators. Uh, so, uh, 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 once uh, I convinced, I think it's my, my board to make that one, and I think that was already the origin of our first business plan. I, I think one of the things, I, I, it's funny because one of the most difficult decisions, once I convinced that we have to invest already in renewables, we have to close our coal and oil power plant, the more difficult thing is going to change the corporate color, which was blue. And I think you see that we are wearing a green uh, uh, tire. And it was the more difficult decision to change from blue to green. Now, fortunately, we are already green and everybody recognizes ourselves for green. So uh, we, uh, we find out a lot of resistance. As I mentioned, competitors were against us. Many investors doesn't understand uh, this move. Uh, and even uh, some regulators uh, did not allow us uh, to sell green energy because they say that the energy has no color. I think we've been denounced by competitors and indeed forced ourselves to stop selling green energy. Uh, 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 we were convinced that that was the right way uh, and we continue. So uh, we continue. Uh, fortunately now we see that there is consensus of this transformation, uh, and now everybody is almost everybody agree that that is uh, the way to, to follow. I think in Paris, 190 government uh, all around the globe agree uh, with uh, to fight against climate change. Uh, uh, I see uh, the, the this ambition uh, of uh, have to increase uh, now in Glasgow. We are the main sponsor in Glasgow, by the way. And we need, but my point is, uh, and I said uh, uh, that for uh, many times, so we need to move from uh, uh, words uh, to action. Raquel, you, you know, we know us uh, for a few years, and you know that I've been repeating this one. Uh, I think it's, uh, I, I was very pleased to hear uh, that uh, uh, by the Prime Minister Boris Johnson is saying it's time for no more blah, blah, blah. I was using the different word, but I think uh, the point now for me is that uh, the time is over. Uh, uh, we need already companies, all sectors. We are have to move, have to move, uh, moving faster uh, for decarbonizing. Yeah. Uh, 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 we are already, uh, I'm already a member of the Security Committee of the European Roundtable for Industry, what is already the 60 largest industrial companies in Europe. And, uh, and we, all we agree uh, to ask the government to move faster on this direction. So, so uh, mm -hmm. that's great. So, uh, Jessica Matthews, I wonder if we could move, you know, what do we need to do to accelerate this transition? What does it look like from you? What are some of the challenges in, in getting from, you know, this, this amazing amount of progress that uh, Ignacio uh, sketched out to where we need to go to meet our climate goals? 
Uh, thank you so much for that uh, for that question, Brad. And I, I want to say thank you to the New York Times for for including me. Um, it is early here in New York, but I am here because this is <laughs> this is important. Um, you know, I think uh, first, if it's okay, I'll, I'll share a little bit about what we do at Uncharted to provide this uh, appropriate context. Uh, Uncharted has always been particularly uh, focused on addressing that exact question. Our mission is. Uh, truly, and um, you know, I, I think at its core, understanding what it takes to accelerate the development of smart and sustainable infrastructure worldwide, understanding these obstacles and breaking them down, and then developing solutions uh, and really looking at building community around addressing these issues. Today, we exist as a data fusion company that works to help cities essentially better refine their data so that they can bring about uh, a smarter, more sustainable world, uh, specifically so that they can become a smart city, right? A city that has uh, you know, reduced carbon emissions, a city that has more reliable uh, electricity services for its citizens at a fraction of the cost. And you know, in becoming this company and in doing the work for a little over now 15 years, which I know is not a lot of time, but for millennial, it is really a lot of time. I, I, uh, <laughs> uh, it's one of those things where I feel like I may be part of the oldest group of individuals who daily contemplate whether or not the planet will outlive us. And that feeling when you go to work is something that cannot be understated. Uh, and so, you know, to your, to your question, Brad, the, I think that the most frustrating thing for, for, for me is the true and honest belief that we actually have so many different ways to address this problem today, but we're not doing the work, that it's not necessarily a technological issue. Uh, it's, it's an issue really of a techno technology adoption. And so specifically what I've seen is, you know, this concept of smart cities is, is a bit of a jargony term that people throw around. Uh, but if you look at it really, it's just the use of technology to improve quality of life. When a city can afford to be a quote unquote smart city, we have seen double digit improvement in quality of life across the board, specifically in the reduction of of harmful emissions to environment, right? It specifically, we're talking about minimum 10%, somewhere upwards to 33% reduction in emissions, which is exactly what we're trying to do in these areas. And w what's interesting too is that, you know, while yes, we want as much renewable energy available as possible, e I believe the EPA cited in 2019 that the largest driver of emissions in our environment right now is transportation. I believe it's 29% compared to 25% in terms of uh, energy generation. And so when we look at the different things we have to focus in on, it's it's not just where we get our power from, it's how we're living in our communities. And, and I truly believe that this idea of becoming um, a smarter city is ultimately what every community can hold on to in a very real and tangible way to address this problem today. And, and so now we have to ask ourselves, why aren't more cities smart cities? And again, people will start to go towards cost and all of these different things. Uh, and, and that's what we've addressed, I think, at Uncharted. Our big focus now is how do we reduce the cost of handling the data that you need to handle at the edge, at the last mile, so that you can naturally give cities access to this uh, amazing cost reduction. And so I believe we need more investment there. I believe we need more uh, impetus for cities to be able to adopt true smart city platforms in this way. Uh, but I also think that we need to promote, I, again, I guess this is probably going to be said in a, quite a few places, but we need to promote the uh, incorporation of new companies, younger companies, uh, new ideas in the testing process of how cities are thinking about tackling this issue. If they're only working with the largest organizations, if they're only working with the utilities, we're not going to get a lot of diversity of thought. And right now we cannot afford to have only a few ideas being tested at the same time. You know, And so I believe that when cities are empowered to work with 
multiple smaller organizations, smaller companies, specifically looking at delivering smart city services in a democratized way and addressing this problem from an entirely different perspective, not just in terms of the generation, that's going to be the fastest way that we can get to where we need to be. All right, uh, so I want to uh, turn, Rachel, obviously we're here now in Glasgow where we're doing uh, COP26 and um, world leaders, businesses, everyone who's here is talking about all sorts of ways they want to create change, whether it's you know countries making climate pledges, you know, new national policies, new alliances to cut methane or save forests, and then, you know, various announcements on finance or whatnot. What levers do you see as, as sort of the most effective for change? I guess one question would be, are, are these international gatherings actually useful for, for spurring momentum um, and transitioning to clean energy? I mean, what role what role do these talks play uh, in making all that happen, or at least helping to make that happen? So the gatherings work, yes, unequivocally. And let me tell you, in every other area of transformation of our society, economy, or whatever, everybody wishes that they had a cop. Mm. Because it, it's, it's like rock climbing. You know, you, you, you put an ice axe up above you, and that's COP26, and then everybody pulls themselves up. And what you're seeing today in Finance Day is a series of announcements coming from every sector of the financial sector, and there's critique that some of it's a bit wishy-washy, or some of it's a bit greenwashy, or some of it's a bit vague, and yes, but let me tell you, six years ago, did anybody yeah. think that we would have $130 trillion, however you count it, in some kind of club moving in the same direction? No. Would you think that yesterday we would have managed to put some money behind a commitment that had been made six years ago on deforestation so that it actually starts to look real and we got $1.7 billion invested in indigenous people's networks who've never seen any financial commitment before despite for 26 cops saying we are the best stewards of the environment. So. I think these meetings work in terms of pulling ourselves up, ratcheting our own sort of commitment to ambition. Where they fall short is that when you add it all up, as the Secretary General requests that we do, and the Secretary General has said that he wants some measures around integrity and guardrails around how we add everything up, we're not there yet, right? So it's a story of we're not there yet, but, every, but things are starting to move in the right direction. Now, what makes it go at speed, right? So science helps you get to scale, but what, we, what we're missing is a lot of the policy, and what we're missing is a lot of the, I think, imagination within policymakers that they can lay policy down, and the stuff that the private sector and communities and everybody else is saying will actually therefore go faster. Mm. So we always talk about the ambition gap. We talk about the finance gap. Actually, we have an imagination gap from policymakers. So we've got negotiators in there coming in with their national positions, trying to protect. You know, and it's like if they just saw that if, that if there was a new agreement, a new policy, a, a, a faith that some of these things would actually happen, things, would, things could go faster. So you've got a lot of skepticism in the developing world because all of these trillions of dollars we're talking about today don't move quickly enough to the communities, to the off-grid renewable energy, to the resilience that these communities need. They certainly don't go quickly enough to cities around the world. And I, I think, you know, we're abs Jessica's absolutely right. I mean, the cities are going to be a big driver of this over the next few years. So they're skeptical. The developed world has not kept up its promises. And so there's lots of really great things coming forward. But fundamentally, the developed world hasn't showed up with the kind of urgency that it needs to. Government's plans are all moving in the right direction. Some of them aren't moving fast or far enough. But underneath all of that, there is definite momentum here. There is definite momentum. Right. Uh, AJ, I, what are your thoughts on how we, we accelerate what's happening now? As you said, there's a, there are a lot of promising things happening in, in moving the world away from fossil fuels towards clean energy, but we need to accelerate. I mean, what do you think are some of the most important things to, to try to help accelerate what's already taking place? Well, <clears throat> there are, I think, four areas where acceleration is needed. The first is, you know, solar is an area, for example, 
where things change almost on a daily basis. Yeah. So for any company or country to develop a plan, you need information as of the moment. So I think the first issue is that for advocacy, you need up-to-date information. Mm -hmm. That's number one. And then leaders can convert it into ways which can convince their constituents that this is something which will provide cleaner, cheaper electricity or will provide more jobs, whatever is, or cleaner environment, whatever is important uh, to their constituents. The second problem, Brad, is that for a very large number of countries, as Rachel said, the money doesn't seem to flow. And I want to emphasize seem to flow because renewables is something in which all the money is put up front. Unlike fossil fuels where 50% of the money is up front, 50% is the cost of coal or gas, and therefore it's very sensitive to the cost of capital, to the interest rate. Now, by the time it reaches the lower end of the spectrum, you know, let's say the bottom half of the pyramid, the money either doesn't flow or if it flows, it's very expensive. This is where we need to address the financial issues. Rachel had this great idea. Why don't we create thousands of guarantee institutions across the world? At the same time, we need also to provide institutions which can help prepare projects. The, the, the private sector is doing it, but the private sector is doing it at a pace at which it is earning money. You need to do much faster. You need to accelerate. Therefore, pots of money for project preparation and for risk mitigation, that will draw the money in and draw it at rates that you and I can afford. That's the second part. The third part is, okay, you know, I'm the head of a country, you ask me to do this, I'll say, okay, that's all great, who will do it? Do my bankers have the capability to look at a project? Do my policymakers have the experience of what is it that they're doing? The balancing, I've heard about it. What on earth is it? Therefore, looking at people and looking at policies and processes. That's the third part. And again, I emphasize that we need to look at this at a global level, not just at the OECD countries, but at all countries. And finally, in many, many countries, and this is almost all the least developed countries and almost all the small island developing states, they don't have the projects which can give leaders and people the confidence that this works. So you tell them, change the policy, they say, sure, we'll change the policy, but why? We need to hold their hand in making these things happen. Once the first project happens, this creates the comfort in the countries that they can change the policies so that a second project, a fifth project, and a hundredth project happen. This is obviously a simplification. But in my view, information, money, people, capacity, and projects, those are the four levers which we need to move on to accelerate the transition. Right. Jessica, did you want to add to that? I saw you respond to it's something AJ had said. Uh, is there? Oh, oh, I, I think, you know, as a dual citizen of Nigeria and the U.S., I think I was just, <laughs> first, just feeling <laughs> incredible accuracy to, to this statement. Um, no, I mean, I think everyone has said uh, the, the reality that I think we, we all agree with, right? Um, I think that uh, specifically one point that AJ mentioned, this confidence around the projects mm -hmm. and understanding around the projects. As a technologist, it's, it, it is something we need to discuss that I, I fear um, often policymakers do not feel equipped to have these conversations. Who is going to be the translator between mm -hmm. the technologists and the people? And are policymakers truly equipped to this? And can they even hire for this? And if they can hire for the, this, can they keep these people? Because usually, uh, you know, people who truly understand the technology are hard to keep in, in the public sector. Uh, and so, you know, I, I do believe that there's several layers of a marketing campaign that needs to, to happen here. Because you need to have uh, public buy-in on every single level. And you need to have so much education uh, that can be uncomfortable, I think, at, at times. I've had conversations with individuals who tell me, you know, all I wanted to do was help, and now I think I need a degree in data science. And it's, it's, it's a bit, it's tough. It's tough because I, I don't actually have 
and I can't necessarily say no, you don't, <laughs> um, you know, in, in this situation. Uh, you know, I'll, I'll give you, you know, a, a perfect example for, for myself. Um, you know, in my mind, I know exactly how you can leverage a smart city platform to actually manage simple things like stoplights and traffic management systems to simply manage, again, assuming there is some basic uh, Wi-Fi communication in the, in the, uh, in the community, to simply manage traffic in a manner that without actually having electric vehicles, mm. you, can reduce, you can reduce emissions from transportation by up to 50%. The issue is what's in my mind is not in every mayor's mind. And that dance of how we explain that is not straightforward. And so the support that needs to be given to cities, I think, it, a J, a, is it a J or AJ? I want to make sure I get that correct. AJ. Names. A J. A J said it perfectly. It's not just the funding, because if you give the cities money and they don't know what to do with it, they mm -hmm. don't have the appropriate talent to know what to do with it in the short, medium, and long term, you're going to have people spending on whatever seems like a uh, politically sexy thing to spend on at the moment to get votes and you're going to continue to have the problem. I would actually say talent and people and understanding are more the, the issue than financing because the most technologists are working towards incredibly affordable solutions that aren't being adopted. And so when you put money towards an issue versus investing in education and understanding and building that bridge, you're actually wasting money. Uh, in, in our cities have suggested that we're seeing just in kind of this forced development of smart cities with very archaic smart city platforms, we're seeing at least 50% of the project cost going to waste. 50% at the start and in running that project over time. And so you can only imagine what, what that actually means then if you can address this issue. Uh, Ignacio, I want to follow up with uh, you on the, the developing world point because, uh, you know, the last uh, International Energy Agency report, which was talking about how we get from where we are today to net zero, you know, it talked about we're going to need to probably triple or quadruple uh, investment in clean energy uh, this decade, you know, is to something like four trillion a year. But they point out that a lot of that is going to have to flow to developing countries mm -hmm. where most of the emissions growth is now and which um, have often uh, struggled a bit more to raise capital. What does that world look like to you? How, you know, how are inroads to expanded clean energy possible in, in emerging economies? I know we are seeing some impressive gains all over the world, you know, places like Vietnam have had a huge boom in solar, mm -hmm. India, but I, I mean, how do we accelerate that? What does that look like from your perspective? I think, uh, first thing, I would like to, uh, to be optimistic in all things uh, globally. Uh, I think, but I think we are too slow. I think COPs are good for uh, already mentalized about the need to do something in a hurry. But I think, as I said before, the time is over. Uh, 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 I think we have all the things necessary in this moment, but I think, as John Kerry is saying, this decade is crucial. Uh, we have the technology, we have the financial resources, we have cheaper solutions, and I, I joined that one with the third world countries. So, uh, uh, the traditional process we have, we have a social demand, but I think we need to work together. I think we need already to work together governments, uh, investors, consumers, industries. Uh, 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 government already, uh, for me, something which is very important is government facilitating permits in a hurry. I think many things which is happening is because the bureaucratic procedures in most countries are too slow. It takes a few months to build a power plant. It takes years to obtain already the permit to make that happen. Second, already, and that is important to the emerging countries, emerging or emerging, to make already predictable mm. legislation and the rule of law. I think if you know the stable and predictable legislation, the money will not flow. Many countries, I think we have a threat to invest because we have not any certainty that the investment is going to have the proper return or the rules is going to be changed in the middle of the game. So, and that is happening in developed countries and, and, and countries already in, in process to be developed. Investors, 
already providing funds uh, to green investment. And I think what Raquel is mentioned is a green investment is not green washing investment. Mm -hmm. mm. So I think in many cases, I think uh, the funds is given with the promises of making things. The funds is not given for the measures of the result of these things. So I think it's very good. The green, the green bonds are there. And the green bond has already facilitated the things, but have to be much more already excision in terms of what sort of uh, where the money is have to be put in, not already in green washing, but a, a, a real one. Industries investing more in R and D and providing competitive solutions uh, for already uh, making, uh, not giving arguments for those one that they nothing, they like that nothing change. And finally, consumers modifying already the uses of the uh, energy toward uh, the uh, decarbonizing solution, like electrifying certain processes or using already uh, hydrogen for high, high temperature processes, etc. So I think to give you an example of those things, all we are talking about electric vehicles. Everybody talks about good charges. Great. Electric vehicle charges are already joined. But without the powerful grid behind, that doesn't work. In many cases, regulators are not understanding Correct. the need Absolutely. already a powerful grid yeah. for already connecting this one. Same thing with renewables. Many people are saying, put yeah. already renewables uh, uh, in some places. But you need already transmission for making mm -hmm. that already. Mm -hmm transport those one. In many cases, I think they are saying, okay, let's use already Britain, what they are in already, funds for transforming boilers into heat pumps, electric heat pumps. Yeah. They provide the money, but they're not providing the money to us, to the electricity companies, to the grid owners, to put the money, our money in the grid for already connecting this one. So all those things are crucial. I think we have to combine the interests of everybody, Correct. legislators, political leaders and governments, industry, finance uh, institutions, and consumers to make all together to make that happen. If not, it not happen. So it cannot be already in Europe in this moment. We are invest we are putting in service half of the megawatt needed for achieving the target for 2030. Half. Why? Not because there are lack of technology. We have the technology. Not because it's lack of money. We have the money. Not because there are already lack of demand, because the demand is there. It's just because the bureaucratic system makes that impossible. Everybody's making opinion about, uh, everybody like green electricity, but nobody would like to have close to their, to their uh, uh, premises of whatever, solar panel, or just a wind farm, or just a tower with a cable. So, and, and, and if you don't change that one, it's going to be impossible. And yeah. the tiny problem is we are not changing the rules and mentalizing then all we have to work together to make that happen. Okay. If not, that's nice words, but nothing is going to happen. Okay. Sorry to yeah. be clear. Uh, that's great. Uh, Rachel, one last question, then we'll get to audience questions. I mean, we've been talking so much about levers for change. You've been watching these uh, international talks uh, for a long time. I mean, what are still, do you see as some of the, the biggest obstacles to change? It feels like, you know, yeah. 20 years ago, we might have talked about climate denial that seems to have somewhat receded as a, <laughs> as a force, but you know, there's still pretty powerful obstacles to, to actually changing. Well, I think if I answer that question through the lens of, 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 of what, what's just been said by Ignacio, because we're, we're, at, we're, at, we're actually at a very critical political moment because um, there is this, um, and using finance as that red thread, right? So we've, we've, over the last few years, finance has walked away from coal. Mm -hmm. Public finance has walked away from coal. Private finance is now running away from coal. We've now got p rumors of an announcement tomorrow that public finance is gonna start to move away from oil and gas, unabated oil and gas. And we've got a coalition against, uh, for no more exploration or development of oil and gas led by Costa Rica and Denmark. And you're gonna see more and more countries joining that. So public money is moving away from oil and gas, and now private money will start to move away as well. Now, the developing countries are sitting there with a set of a political class that knows how energy systems worked in the past, right. can't quite imagine what energy systems are going to look like in the future. And if this is all good, but we have got to ramp up exactly. the finance and the technical support to these countries so that they can, they can not just be starved of the finances for the 
fossil fuel energy system and everything that runs off it, but for that green energy system. And if at meetings like this, that big ticket commitment of finance for the green energy isn't there and we can't get it down and deployed into countries, then you will start to see a rancorous political debate between the North and South again. Now, I'm optimistic because there's a lot of new capital being mobilized for that green energy, but we've got to do that and our leaders have got to deliver it. So we're, we're at a sort of politically important moment because we can't just take away, we've got to give. And that's why the 100 billion and the financial commitments that don't get made are so important because you know, for, for these countries, especially for the least developed and the, mm -hmm. the, the most vulnerable, you know, the, the, the costs of climate change are ratcheting up constantly. Yeah. Uh, James, sir, I think you had to add to Well, <clears throat> I completely agree with Rachel. The, 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 the short point is simply that if you look at the bottom of the pyramid, and we're talking of those thousand million people who do not have access to clean electricity or clean cooking fuels, this moment provides an opportunity for them, but it provides an opportunity only if that opportunity is exploited. Now, how on earth do you exploit it? We need business models, we need people who are trained in this, and we need finance. In my view, the finance will flow if the right business models are there, because these are intrinsically uh, uh, investments that will pay for themselves. <clears throat> Similarly, if you're looking at the, you know, people talk about green hydrogen, green hydrogen will make sense as long as you can bring prices down. And the price of the electrolyte is no reason at all. When we've seen the prices of solar panels fall, we've seen the price of batteries fall, there's no reason why the prices of electrolyzers won't fall. But the developing countries have to be convinced that this is something that is happening on their turf. I think the global cooperation and coalitions that can help make this happen are the real accelerators of change. Can, uh, I, can I just say yeah. that, the, 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 in the other era of a developing country leader or in a developed country leader is an extremely powerful fossil fuel lobby yeah. that is yakking away all the time saying, you know, well, it used to be that coal was the answer to energy poverty. Well, I think that one's done and dusted now in most parts of the world. But now it's, you know, gas is the answer to energy poverty. Gas is part of the transition in certain countries. It is yeah. not the answer in many others. In fact, leapfrogging will be. Yeah, I mean, um, but So it's, it's not like there's no other noise going on. You know, the, you, know, you develop gas pipelines today and you have stranded assets day after tomorrow. Yeah. yeah. We don't want those kinds of decisions being taken. Yeah. Um, this has been great. I think we're going to go to, we have time for some audience questions. Uh, do, I don't know if we have some from online or in the room. Thanks, Brett. Uh, we have a couple of questions from the virtual audience. Uh, firstly, Ignacio mentioned earlier in the session that the technology to address our climate crisis already exists. What do you think the greatest barriers to scaling the adoption of those technologies at the pace we need to and across the world are, and how might we overcome them? Okay. And let's, uh, let, let's keep the answers pretty brief so we can make sure we can get through other questions. But Ignacio, do you want to briefly you know, just list off like two or three of the biggest barriers? So, uh, I, 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 think, I think my point of that one is I insist on the words. We have the technology, I think we see how the things actually evolve, the technologies in solar, the technologies in wind, the technologies in offshore, the technologies in batteries, the technologies in pumping storage. So, uh, it's there. So, the money, we are ready, the uh, sector, we are ready to invest. We are investing, we, even Droga, we have a plan of investing $180 billion in this decade, $90 billion from now to 2025, which is already a huge amount of money, much more than we've been investing before. So, we are ready to invest. But what we need is coherence, stability, rules, uh, 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 stability rules, and uh, uh, rule of law, and predictability. I think cannot be changed the goals of the target of the countries just because of temporary storm in energy prices. If we have seen those days, 
We are in slightly stone because of the high prices of natural gas, which is affecting to electricity, is affecting those things. And their country has already decided long time ago to move from out of coal. Now it's coming back to coal. So that is already generating just an uncertainty what, why we have to make that one. Europe, we have been very successful with the ETS, with the European trading system of the carbon prices. So Europe has already increased our GDP by 60% in the last 50 years, and our emissions have reduced by 40, 45%. And suddenly, because the prices increases, there are people which are saying the reason is because the carbon price is too high. And that's why we have to, to put in crisis this one. We cannot make the changes that the world requires, and the investment has to flow if we are changing the rules just because of temporary uh, storms and we, uh, and we change already the long term, be a long term, a long term already strategies. So that's why for me, stability, predictability, rule of law is crucial to achieve the decarbonizing target in, the, uh, in all countries. And that is not already happening enough. So in most cases, I think people is becoming nervous because of temporary problems, which is affecting many people, but I think uh, the problem of the planet is affecting to everybody. It's not affecting temporarily somebody else. That's, so stability, predictability, rule of law is crucial. That's great. Uh, yeah, let's, do we have more questions, either in the audience or uh, back there? My name is Katie Patterson. I'm from Dusan Babcock and also support the Net Zero Needs Nuclear campaign. So I just want to understand from the panel, you mentioned renewables and green hydrogen and gas, but what, what are your thoughts on nuclear energy as a way to meet the climate crisis? It's a, it's a ready techno technology that's available now. It's proven, low carbon, base load electricity. Uh, who uh, feels excited to field a uh, nuclear question? <laughs> Well, I, I mean, I, I could start. Maybe RJ wants to follow. I, I mean, I think that for countries with with a history of, of nuclear power, uh, with a planning capability around that, then it, it, the, the new nuclear new nuclear technologies will you know p make sense. Um, I but I think the planning horizons and the timelines involved oh, with different. nuclear yeah. and the cost to the public purse, exactly. you, you need, in most situations, you're gonna need public um, involvement, R restricts nuclear to certain countries and, than others, and the timelines we're looking at don't help us with this sort of extraordinary bending of the curve that we need this decade. So I think it is part of the solution in some countries. I don't see it becoming like a global phenomenon at, at this point. And then I think the other thing is that we've seen that the social norms around nuclear can switch. Uh, Japan has switched from being pro-nuclear to anti-nuclear to being pro, again, it depends on other events. And so you need that public support for nuclear as well to be part of the mix. So a solution in some places, but in terms of the available renewable technologies that we have right now that need to be installed right now in order to get to halving emissions by 2030, nuclear plays a part, but only a part in that. Okay. You like, I can, uh, uh, you know me, I can add something on this, on this point. May I? Uh, Aye. Yeah. Okay, yeah. Yeah, uh, we, we, we operate certain uh, nuclear reactors. So we are a large producer of nuclear power uh, in, in, in Spain. So uh, there are two things which we have to put in mind and like what Raquel is saying. I think those ones, which is existing one, they are, uh, I think they are, uh, they are not cheap. So nuclear is not a cheap technology. Yeah. Today, yeah. Yeah. we can produce electricity with cheaper sources than nuclear. The second thing is because there is a perception that nuclear is cheap, in some countries they are charging taxes which yeah. are making less competitive. Correct. So which I think that is, that is a, it is, uh, but for another side, they are needed for this transition period. With that, is a contradiction. They are not cheap. I think they are cheaper sources, but because they are perception, they are cheap, they are charging with taxes, we make less competitive. But for another side, those technologies are needed in the transition period to keep already lights on. And I think that is the sort of contradiction that we are facing in many countries when we are talking about the energy transition. So that is the clarity I was saying about the stability, predictability, rule of law. 
because uh, uh, who is going to invest in nuclear in those which exist in nuclear, which I think theoretically have to be cheaper than the new ones, are not cheaper. And also they have to absorb certain charges and taxes which make less competitive. And they are, they are forced to keep that open just because the system requires those ones. So I think those things need, need to be clarified if we would like to make already this transition in a real successful manner. Okay. Uh, other questions? I think uh, a gentleman in the audience there. Yeah, I'm going to down and say that with the Environment Agency in, in, here in Scotland. So my question is about whether the regulatory frameworks, and it's not just the energy industry that we deal with, it's across all industries. Are the regulatory frameworks that we have keeping pace with the acceleration that the panel have talked about on the basis, which I think is true, that good regulation spurs innovation and creates the sort of certainty that Ignacio was talking about. Uh, anyone want to? Uh, well, uh, okay. regulatory change is something which we are experimenting with as we move ahead. You spoke about innovation. That's an extremely important thing. The financial industry looks at regulation as something which provides it a certainty of returns. We have not seen regulatory systems change so as to address the entire issue of challenges because we were talking about nuclear. Supposing you have small modular reactors which are cheaper than the price of nuclear that you get today, that will change the equation. Would the regulatory framework be in a position to manage it? Similarly, the markets are changing. With batteries, we will have uh, things which buy electricity during the day and sell electricity during the night. Are the regulatory frameworks ready for that? Short point is, the change is occurring, but it is occurring gradually, and in different countries, it's occurring at a different pace. We need to understand how regulatory systems change can be accelerated. Uh, Jessica, I wonder if you want to follow up, because you've been doing a lot of work with smart cities. Is, is that true in that, that area? Yes, I actually, you know, I, I wanted to say a few quick words on this because I think something uh, Jay mentioned earlier really comes to the core of this, this idea of information. Uh, from the work that we're doing, the core issue that we see is that the, the regulatory groups do not actually have access to the information that they need to be able to do their jobs, I think, at the scale and efficiency that the, uh, that, that, that the market needs. Uh, it's beyond even just the changing information, but what we're finding is that because there is a true, uh, I would say almost like data supply chain issue, that's what we're seeing at the last mile. When you look at not only the way the technologies are struggling to work with each other, struggling to actually be able to communicate with each other in a way that allows for scaled use, um, but also the way the different departments are simply siloing their information, what ends up happening is that a lot of the regulatory groups will almost be frozen in paralysis, right? Like just fr frozen in action um, because they don't know what they don't know. Mm -hmm. They're aware that they don't know what they don't know, and they feel that the safest thing to then do is to do nothing yeah, or move through the status absolutely. quo. That is at the core, the, the, the true issue, uh, the, the, the comment around, you know, good regulation breeds innovation, uh, then we have not, I, I, maybe I'm saying a very strongly worded statement, but we have not had good regulation for as long as I've been in the workforce. Um, that's not where we are right now. And it's not anyone's any individual's fault. Um, you know, the world that we're living in right now it requires Every person, we, we need way more people involved because everything is interrelated. Everything needs to be interoperable. And that's the core issue that we have single kind of specialized subject matter experts driving these things forward, not realizing that you, you really can't solve this problem if you just know about one type of energy or energy in general. Uh, you, you have to understand infrastructure. You have to understand what's actually consuming this power and how everything works together. And just so few people understand this and so few people are kind of being brought into this conversation, which I think goes back to what Rachel was saying earlier, that these, these, these efforts, these events, they do help because they bring us all together to start to shed light on these uh, areas where we, we lack information. But it is probably to me the, the biggest 
mm-hmm. obstacle in getting anything done. Um, a, a new idea is considered a dangerous idea yeah. if you don't understand it. Yeah. Uh, well, that's a really great uh, note to end on, particularly the idea of bringing people together and learn from each other. I feel like I've uh, learned from all the panelists here today. I hope everyone enjoyed this. So I really want to thank you all for being here. This was a terrific discussion. Um, and uh, there will be more great events at the Climate Hub. So uh, stay with us, and thank you all. Thank you. Thank you.